Welcome to my four month review of Starlink. My name is Aaron. My wife and I are full time RVers traveling around the country and internet connectivity is a big deal to us. At first we thought Starlink might be an all in one solution for us, but after using it for the past four months, we have found out that it is not. So today I'm gonna to share a few of our personal experiences over the past few months on why Starlink is becoming a good backup for us and why it may not be an all-in-one solution for you. And I'm gonna share a little sneak peek on something we're trying out that potentially will be our all-in-one number one solution for internet on the road. Now I have heard from many people that Starlink works great for them and they are basically using it as their only solution for RVing. But what I don't understand is if you actually do move around and you're not staying in just a single location, uh, how you actually have consistent uptime from Starlink. So for the most part, in the past four months, uh, Starlink has worked very well in about six locations probably out of close to like 20 locations. So maybe for us, it's working 25 to 35% of the time. And I kind of consider that a backup. And if you also think about travel days and single overnight stops, Starlink becomes an even bigger issue because you can't use it 24 seven. And if you are just heading to a Cracker Barrel a rest stop or a Walmart, you're most likely not gonna bust out your Starlink to get your internet going. So there's a lot of limitations on that side of it. And I've already put out multiple videos covering all of the issues that we've had with Starlink over the past few months. And that's actually where someone from a small company called Instant Connect, Nick, reached out to me and said, hey, I have a solution that I think is gonna work really good for your scenario. And I wasn't really that familiar with Instant Connect, but it does sound like a really great solution. It's basically a 5G modem with a 5G router and also a 4x4 MIMO antenna that goes on the roof. Now I just installed the NC Connect system the other day, so I'm gonna do a full review after I've used it for a little bit of time and really get a good feeling for the system. But I don't even know how to explain this, but the speeds that I've recorded off of this right away are mind-blowing. So the Insta Connect system is using our Verizon Unlimited SIM card that we have and so I took five speed tests um, on just our Verizon MIMO hotspot that we use in our window. This is what we've been using for the past three years or so and then I did five speed tests of Starlink and then once I got the Insta Connect system hooked up I did five speeds of that. And so our Verizon hotspot with the window MIMO antenna got around 15 megabits per second download speeds. And the Starlink system got around 100 megabits download speed. And the InstiConnect got around 132 megabits download speed. So amazingly, it's performing faster speeds than Starlink right now. And what it did to our difference between our standard hotspot to just having this 4x4 MIMO antenna on the roof and this router on the inside, um, crazy speeds that we're seeing right now. And of course, speeds aren't everything, but it's a great indication of how fast a surface you're gonna get. Um, but I'm gonna get more into all of the details on that on the review. Um, but let's continue on with talking about our Starlink experience for the past couple months here. And I wanna start out in North Carolina. Okay, I'm pretty excited now because I think we are in a location where our Starlink is really gonna shine. We just got to our campsite in Sneeds Ferry, North Carolina. It's called Harbor Point. It's uh, down by Topsail Beach, I believe. Uh, we just got here, we're kind of new to the area, but as soon as we got here, we have one or two bars of our T-Mobile phones. We couldn't even place a phone call to the front desk when we got here at the gate. And our Verizon right now is non-existent. So, we're going to be here for a week. We need to have internet service. This is really why we are keeping Starlink, even though it hasn't been able to be really used in the last half dozen or so places we've been at. Uh, it's places like this where we don't have any other options. And instead of us just leaving early and going someplace else, we can now hopefully work and uh, enjoy some high speed internet. 
So I'm gonna show you our setup because Starlink is really quick. Once we kind of hardwired it into our RV, it only takes a couple minutes for me to deploy it and get it set up. I still do need to get something for the roof though, uh, some type of ladder or pole mount. I just haven't ordered one because we're moving every two or three days and we just don't have time to get something ordered. So we store our Starlink dish in its original box and we just keep it in the truck mostly. And then inside this box on the tongue jack is where I keep the cable itself. And this cable itself uh, goes in through the bottom of our RV here, uh, underneath the bed to the modem inside. So now I can just take the cable out and run what I need where I need it to go. If you ever have problems getting the cable into the dish, um, all you need to do is shim a little piece of paper underneath this to, to help lift up the angle to get it in there. I had to do that the first few times and now it's been going in, but you can see right here, it's not going all the way in. Oh, there it just pops in. So this little connector can be very, very finicky, uh, but it just popped in. So if you ever have issues with that, uh, just Google Starlink connector, paper shim, and it'll sh pop up, but uh, it's really simple to just put underneath there and slide it in. And you can see here that Starlink ended up working really, really good in this situation with speeds of 187 down and 27 up. And then you can also see the uptime on the right side of the screen was practically 100%. So no trees obstructing us here. And this was a situation where we were glad to have Starlink. So from North Carolina, we were headed over to Lebanon, Tennessee, where we were there for an RV rally for an entire week. The few stops that we made along the way, Starlink was not a good option at all, so it didn't even come out of the box. And when we did get to this RV rally, we were there on the early side, so our Verizon hotspot was working perfectly fine. We were there for the event and we weren't necessarily doing as much computer work, so the internet wasn't as big of a deal. But anytime you get a large amount of RVers in one area, what happens is cell tower congestion. And that's actually where Starlink can shine, although it has its own form of congestion. But that's kind of what happened in Tennessee where our Verizon speeds just kind of kept getting slower and slower and slower. And for us, it wasn't a huge deal. Like I mentioned, we weren't really using our internet as much, but I did talk to a few other people there that were using Starlink and it was working great for them. So that's a good scenario where Starlink can really shine is at these RV rallies where um, the cell towers are over congested and Starlink has a better rate of speed. But then what's gonna happen when more and more people have Starlink? So from Tennessee, we were headed back up north to Wisconsin and Minnesota. We stopped at a few places in Indiana. One of the campsites was completely covered in trees. So again, Starlink was not even an option at all. And the second place we were staying at was in a parking lot. So we were there for a few days. And again, I just don't wanna take Starlink out um, in the parking lot if there's no need to when the Verizon's working perfectly fine. But back to cell tower congestion, when we were in Madison, Wisconsin, it was over the 4th of July holiday. And it was pretty amazing to watch our Verizon uh, shrink and shrink and shrink. And this time it went down to unusable speeds. We couldn't connect to websites. You couldn't watch Netflix. It completely went down. And now our site was partially covered by trees, but we did have a little bit of an angle to the northern sky, so I was hoping and praying that Starlink was gonna save us in this situation. And it kind of did. It was usable enough to get us speeds to connect and do kind of light computer work. We didn't have any congestion like the Verizon towers were. I don't think anybody in this park or in the surrounding area was really using Starlink at all. We had no problem moving our service address to this location, but because there was trees 
in the line of view of Starlink, um, it actually did have those one to five second drops. So again, zoom calls would not have been very good, but it was perfectly fine for light internet use and streaming, watching Netflix, things like that. Uh, no problem at all. So again, that's why we have it as a backup. It worked good in that situation. I also want to explain on these little charts that I keep showing here. On the left side, you'll see 100% uptime and then down to 0% uptime. And basically you want 100% uptime. You want the chart to be up close to that top line. The little white lines up there are fine. And then when they go all the way down to the bottom line, which says 0%, that's basically when you have dropped internet service. But at the same location in Madison, Wisconsin, we actually experienced our very first complete outage by the rain or a small storm that was passing through the area. You can see here at about six o'clock on the far right of this chart, it turns solid blue. And this is when it was raining and that's when it completely dropped. You can see on this next graph, the whole screen is almost completely blue, which means we had zero service for an entire hour. And that's the very first we've ever experienced that. People ask if it's affected by rain and by storms. And the short answer is yes, it is affected. Light rain, light storms, maybe you'll get a little bit of slowed service, but you also have the possibility of having a complete outage in not even that bad of weather. So if I was relying on this 100% for work, I don't even know how that would be possible. I mean, are you going to call in to your boss and say it's raining outside? I don't have any internet service. I can't clock in today. It just doesn't make sense for it to be 100% uh, your, your full service provider uh, with these types of outages. The next location I want to talk about is Goose Island RV Park in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Now our Verizon was working perfectly fine there, but I still wanted to test out Starlink because we had a pretty clear view of the sky and trees was not an issue where we were at. But this was the first place in, I think four months that I could not move my service address to the location we're at. So I had to activate roaming, which is that $25 extra fee. And by the way, we have the residential service. So it's 110 per month. You activate roaming when you need it, which is $25 per month, and you can turn on and off the $25 roaming charge. So this was our first experience of Starlink congestion, and I had no idea what that was or how that actually worked. I've heard of some people complaining about these ridiculous Starlink speeds that we've never experienced, and now we actually got to see the high usage Starlink RVer uh, throttled congestion and we were maxing out at around five megabits per second. And this is where it gets kind of frustrating because if I was an RVer Starlink user and I was always getting throttled, I'd be really kind of frustrated with those types of speeds, five megabits during, you know, evening and morning time, maybe in the middle of the day you get better speeds, which I think we did see, you know, 40, 50, 60s. I mean, it, it really did fluctuate. But this is what we're kind of running into as more and more people have Starlink is that I can't move my service address as easily and that's going to be a bit of a problem. So it has me kind of contemplating, do we want to switch to the RV or service since this is just a backup? Maybe we only use Starlink uh, a few months out of the year. We haven't made it to the West Coast yet, which we think we're going to be heading out maybe later this year. And I know that's where Starlink really does shine. So maybe that's where it's going to be used, um, you know, the majority of the time. But if you're going to be running into these throttled speeds, then I'm just going to be using my Verizon. And if this Insta Connect is going to get, going to be giving me speeds like it's doing right now, um, I'm going to have less and less need for Starlink as we go. So as a backup, it's becoming very expensive, 110 to $135 for a backup system, um, something to think about. One thing I do understand is that if people don't have a true unlimited cellular plan like we do for Verizon, if you only have 10 gigabits of fast, high speed usage on your cell phone, and then maybe you have 20 on a jetpack or hotspot or something like that, then it would make sense to use Verizon more and more because of the unlimited speeds, especially if you're doing a lot of streaming. But because we already have this high speed unlimited Verizon plan, uh, we have 
less use, I think, for Starlink than maybe most people. So I am curious, do you have Starlink as your main internet service provider? or are you using it as a backup like we are. I think I wanna to commit to myself to using this for maybe 12 months just to make sure Starlink is changing all the time, sometimes for the good, sometimes for the bad, but I'm just not quite ready to give it up yet. I am really, really curious to see how this InstiConnect system does as we travel around the country. The speeds are absolutely amazing right now, outperforming our Starlink and the location we're at, so. Lots of good stuff to come. Stay tuned for that review, which will be out hopefully shortly. And we'll see you on the next video. Mm -hmm.